Okay. Um, hello, everyone, um, and welcome back to day two of Digital Ecologies in Practice here at the University of Bonn. And um, welcome to our Zoom participants and those joining via YouTube Live today as well. Thanks so much to everyone who participated, exhibited, and conversed yesterday. Um, it was such a nourishing day, and I think all of the organizing team and everyone that I spoke to thoroughly were thoroughly inspired by all of the, the works that were shown. So I'm going to kick off today with a brief introduction of the day's plan before introducing today's keynote speaker, Professor Ron McCoy. First of all, I just want to thank our sponsors again, who enabled all these wonderful people to come together. They are the Data Research Foundation, the University of Bonn, and the Oslo School of Environment and Humanities. Today, we're following a more traditional conference format, and you can find the schedule online and in the printed booklet. We're joined today by several remote speakers and are broadcasting live on YouTube. For those of you on YouTube, please join in as much as you can by writing comments and questions in the live chat, which we're going to be monitoring um, all day. And on Zoom too, um, we're really delighted to have you uh, and you're being broadcast live into the room. So get involved um, as much as you can. In between sessions, we're going to keep the same live stream link going all day. So please use this same link for all of the sessions. Just a quick note on the social media stuff too. None of these sessions are being recorded or shared online apart from Professor Okari's keynote this morning. So don't share the link anywhere as it won't work after today. That said, if you do want to share your work or reflections on the work of any others, um, please tag us at Digicologies. As I mentioned yesterday, following the conference, we're putting together a special issue of cultural geographies and practice which will involve creative and original texts of around 2,000 words that either reflect on your own practice or the practice of others in relation to digital ecologies. So we really want to encourage everyone that's attending um, to submit abstracts by the deadline at the end of October. So if you've got any questions about this, please get in touch with us and we'll send more information about this after the conference. We're also always looking for more informal and creative pieces for our blog on the website. So email us team at digicologies.com with any ideas and share your work with us so we can send it through our networks. So to today's keynote, we're delighted to be joined by Professor Ron Wakari. Professor Wakari is a professor in the School of Interactive Arts and Technology at Simon Fraser University in Canada, where he founded the Everyday Design Studio. He's also a professor and chair of design for more than human-centered worlds at Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. Professor Okari's research investigates the changing nature of design in response to new understandings of human technology relations and post-humanism. He aims to reflectively create new design exemplars, theory, and emerging practices to contribute generously and expansively to understanding ways of designing that are more accountable, cohabitable, and equitable. Professor Okari's research covers a vast array of topics from exploring the everyday practices and home life of designers, as well as DIY practitioners and amateur experts, to more recently, the potential of Apple Face ID software as a drag, queer, and trans technology design tool. In 2021, he published a monograph with MIT Press entitled Things We Could Design, in which he shifts our focus from human-centered design towards designing with non-humans. Today, we're going to hear more about the things we could design with non-humans. So I'm delighted to pass over to today's keynote, Professor Ron Lutari. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, and, and thank you, Julia, and the whole Digital Ecologies team uh, for inviting me here this morning. And uh, yeah, for those of you online, uh, welcome. And yesterday was a fantastic day. Unfortunately, you weren't able to join us, but I think it was really inspiring to see some of the work um, and some of the discussion that really, I think, is um, important, I think, just for kind of where we are now, the kind of urgencies, the matters at hand, the more expansive thinking, um, I think the greater kind of interdisciplinary that's called for. So it was, it was really a wonderful day yesterday, and today I'm sure will be just as great. Mm -hmm. I wanted to point out, of course, that yesterday, uh, James Lovelock died. Uh, so the, the founder of the notion of Gaia, um, really inspired by Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. And of course, I've really, um, read all the tours, reworking of Gaia, I think is, is, is really quite amazing. Um, and, and related, to, which I think the work that many of us are indebted to, but Lynn Margulis's work as an evolutionary biologist, 
Um, and I think just kind of rethinking that kind of precedes a lot of the thinking that we are discussing today. And uh, and anyway, I just wanted to to, to note that. Um, so I don't have any slides. <laughs> uh, how do I do that? Oh, there we go. And let's see. Uh, Huh? Is that working? Do I have to share the screen for Zoom? I'll do it. Okay. So a, a technological pause. Yeah. Julie is amazing. Not only did she pick such a great restaurant last night, but obviously <laughs> <laughs> technological capacity is overwhelming. Um, so I I'm Ron Wakari, as, as Johnny said, I, 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 guess I call myself a design researcher. Um, and so I research, and I, I, why I call myself a design researcher is, of course, also my background in design, but also I research, I know there's a phrase, research through design, but I really think that I try to understand the world and ask research questions through making, through designing. So not just questions about design, but I think all the, the larger questions and that we can do this through the making of things. And much of my career has been in the field of what's known as human computer interaction. Um, and and, and uh, it's been actually, for me, a very generous field, a lot of interesting discussions, intersex technologies, people. What it, it doesn't do is really, there's a lot of things at the boundaries that it doesn't do particularly well. And I've always thought that my work has been about it, the boundaries of this kind of discipline and understand whether the notions of interaction or particularly the notions of human centeredness and, and, and where that comes from. And, how we can think past that in the ways in which we think about designing. So as Johnny mentioned, I'm going to be talking a lot about a book that actually was released August 2021. Um, and in it, I was really compelled or mobilized by this question, what does it mean to design for more than human worlds? And, and um, so what do I mean by more than human? Uh, so I, I, I sort of draw on what you want to say is critical post-humanities. So thinking through the feminist epistemologies of Donna Haraway, for example, in the Cyborg Manifesto, in the Species Manifesto, but really also others, whether it was Ibridati or Maria de la Casa, um, but I think notions of kind of matters of care. That, and I think deeply, if feminist epistemologies really impact, I think, kind of the power struggles within the notions of epistemologies and knowledge making, but also deeply informed post-humanism in terms of relationality thinking through how things are relational, and I'll speak more to that later. Um, I mentioned Bruno Latour that also very much influenced me in you know, notions of philosophies of technology. Latour is certainly known for the notion of active network theory and actors included those that were not human. But this idea of shared agencies across things that, that humans are not the only ones uh, that should be considered in terms of uh, in which, with respect to notions of agency, but also just the understanding, I think one of the, 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 the titles I like best about Bruno Latour's work is this notion of missing masses, that to not pay attention to things that are not human is to really miss out on what much of what constructs our world and shapes our world. But other philosophies of technology, like post-phenomenology, um, on ID, Peter Paul Verbeek, and what the, for me, as someone who's not a, not a philosopher, but more but a designer, it was the kind of specificity to which they talked about things that really, rather than things and technologies as being categories, they had specific materiality, they were of the world, and we could reflect on them being of the world. And of course, much of the discussion around more than human, um, and this notion of a shared agency preceded a lot of, most, almost all, all of Western European thought, it was really part of the indigenous cosmologies, indigenous ways of knowing um, I, I think that the, the, and of course it goes within uh, non-Western European thinking of Asian, but also in, indigenous and Aboriginal. And, you know, understood today much in the, in the context of decolonizing practices. And I think what's so important about this is not just an, an understanding of the past, but a political reality of now. It's a site of political action, these ideas of relationality and shared agency. And, I, I, you know, on that note, I just wanted to point out, I wish that I was more influenced by these people when I was writing, but uh, current contemporary indigenous scholars that are working, writing on notions of the Anthropocene, writing very much about this notions of more than human design, um, understanding the very perspectives, for example, how White's notion that the Anthropocene is sort of a back to the future, that there's certainly been an era amongst 
indigenous in which you can talk about erasure and removal of land and erasure and removal of culture, much of which now is captivating all of us as essential fear. So the the book kind of you know working through these theories kind of takes aim at much of what these theories take aim at, which is the notion of humanism, this notion of the age of enlightenment, Western European humanism, this idea of really what we can understand is human exceptionalism. And it infuses everything. It's a human-centered design. It really grew on humanist and humanism is a way of knowing the world. It, it, it's hard for us even to think past it because it infuses every thing that we've known from our legal structures to our, to our, to our structures of governance, to education systems, to universities, is are all really indebted to shape by notions of, of, of humanism. And humanism as a, as a kind of principle, as you can see here with the um, drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, known as the Vitruvius Man, which was the application of uh, the architect um, Vitruvius's ideal proportions to the human body. And, and to symbolize the kind of perfectionism of human reason, the notion that human reason was, was, was exceptional above all else. And it was human reason that not some God, which is really what it was removing it itself from, but another, no other species on the planet would really be able to shape, die, or determine who we are. And humanism became a project to perfect the notion of human reason, to perfect our understanding and our relationship to the world. But of course, in the midst of all of this, what in large part in the last few centuries been totally blind to, which is actually the real impact, the real anthropogenic impact of us on this planet, uh, and namely the climate crisis that we find ourselves in. So it would be ironic if it wasn't so existential, this idea that we were so compelled or so focused on who and what we were and how we act in this world that we were really oblivious to how in fact we really were acting in this world. And the humanist project was not necessarily a project for all humans, uh, but if you were black or brown, that you were not seen to be human or seen to be part of the humanist project, that you needed salvation, you needed to be rescued from notions of savageness, or if not, simply exploited. Um, and, and, and that was the role within the humanist project, and this was something that needed to be undone and not for the legacy. So, so these are the things in many ways, and this doesn't the fact that they shape very much who we are and how we think and how we structure our world. They come with a set of legacies that are really converging now and a set of urgencies that I think we really have to tackle. And that's really why we, I think, I, I think very much in this conference is a kind of generosity and expansiveness of thinking to think through, um, I think, where we are. So that's really what the book is about, is to theorize a practice of what it means to design for more than human world, in large part, I was focused on technologies, but also in this broader sense. And now I'm actually working in a multi-species context with bees and with moths. I'm happy to ask answer questions about those later. But the point, the goal of what is the good in design was this notion of cohabiting. So how within this more than human world, how do we seek ways to cohabit better? Um, th there are a couple of, of it, it's a book on theory. There are some concepts that I, that I generate, there are a number of concepts, but there's three that I want to focus on. And I'm telling you what they are now, because there's going to be a bit of a journey toward getting there. And then I'll, I'll return to this. And this isn't meant to be a quiz or anything, but just so you know, these are like, uh, I'm talking about speaking subject and, and biography and constituency, and I'll get to what those mean near the end. But the whole concept that I'm talking about is this idea of designing with. What does it mean to design with? So I would navigate through that. I think there's a series of, of draw two, I've already mentioned some of them, two key concepts that kind of guide me through this. First, the notion of relationality. And this is really counter to some of the exclusionary notions of humanism that have separated humans from nature, humans from technology, mind and body, the sets of exclusionary kind of ways of understanding and categorizing the world. That relationality is one in which it's situated, it's performative. Things only mean something in relation to something else. And that's, that's really key to a way of thinking forward. There's our own interdependency with the very world we're in is a relational uh, 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 nature. The second one is shared agencies. So this idea that we alone, if you can think about humanism, that the idea that human that human reason reasoning is the only has the only capacity to act in this world when in fact it's actually a, a matter of shared agencies. And I'll also speak about that. And I sort of start the book, I set it up in this sort of structure of thinking about, uh, talking about design as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a, I guess, a practice, 
and I, and I talk about things, what are things, and then I talk about who we are, is what, who we are as designers, how do we act in this world. Um, Ken and I kind of talk, try to rethink some kind of assumptions. So the first one is this notion that humans and things are co-constituted. So in the world of, of human computer interaction, we always think that this that is actually our task is to find ways for people to interact with technologies. That this is some kind of gap that we have to somehow bridge, somehow that we have to design through aesthetics or through allure or through some kind of charm, some kind of exp uh, express utility to get people to use technologies. When I argue really that we are always use technologies, that we're fund they're fundamental to us as we are fundamental to it. This is a um, running shirt uh, by the fashion tech designer, Pauline Van Dungen. She actually did her, her PhD with me in Eindhoven. It's an illuminated running shirt. So it's hard to see because the slide is quite dark, but you can see the illuminations of the running shirt. And in many ways, this is what um, Guy Haraway refers to as the cyborg. And uh, Guy Haraway always talked about the fact that we are already cyborgs. And she pointed out one example is putting on your running shoes. So you're a cyborg us here wearing clothes, we're, 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 we have these kind of uh, 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 attachments to us um, that shape who we are. And so for example, in the running shirt, and certainly the materials of a running shirt is what makes it run, it's lightness. The ability for the, the material to wick away sweat to kind of keep an optimal body temperature as you're running. In the case of the shirt is being lit, it turns its runner into a nocturnal runner as it turns cars into nocturnal vehicles. The ability to navigate and be shaped and to move in a world of, of darkness. And so this co-shaping between who and what you are is a kind of fundamental relationship. One could not be a runner without, these, without this. One could not be a shirt without human wearing it. I like another term for this, Harry Wolf, you know, prosthetic creatures. And this is, I think, that as, as, as humans, we always kind of have this notion to find things other than us and attach them, literally attach them to our bodies. It shouldn't be odd, we're actually in a world of prosthetic creatures. And this goes to Donna Haraway's notion of not, the, the lack of binarism between nature and culture, that this interweaving interdependency between nature and culture, that we're not the only ones that seek out prosthetics. And, and, and even in areas where we go beyond functionality, we think, what does it mean to be religious, regardless of what that religion is? This is um, this piece here, sort of tau-shaped device. My uh, uh, designer uh, researcher, Bill Gaber, Interaction Research Studio, it's called the Prayer Companion. It was a project he did with cloistered nuns in the UK. So of course, these are nuns who don't leave the cloister. And what this is, you, you can't see at the top of that tau is a, it's like a ticker tape, news feed that goes by that was scraped from the internet. And it's something that the nuns could use for their daily prayer. So they can understand what's going on in the world and they can use these little news feeds for daily prayer. When we think about this technology as kind of a added to their sense of religiosity. But then if you look again, if you look at the clothing, you look at the habit, you understand religious artifacts, you look at the architecture, but this whole kind of prosthetics and attachment and co-construction and creating what it even means to be religious is really fundamentally bound up into, in, into things. And if you design, you think, well, you know, that the design then is to fundamentally shape who we are. And I think that is on some levels true. However, I'll get to the fact that we're not the only ones that design, that that capacity, if you like, is actually quite limited. Okay, so the second you know, idea talked about in the book is this notion that in fact, we're not the only ones who have agentic force or ability or capacity. So things have agency. I if you can see this clearly. This is a um, intersection in a town in the Netherlands in Bodegraven. Um, can you see this light? Can anyone tell me what that's for? Guessing game part of the talk? Anything, just what, why, why is there this light on the sidewalk? For cars? No. Yeah, yeah, but what kind of pedestrians? Cyclists? No. Okay, I won't drag you side. It's if you're walking across the street with your phone, so you're looking down, so you don't have to look up. So you can see that it's green, you can cross, red, you can't come. <laughs> and of course, when this happens, it's a prototype, and like there was the kind of like, oh, here we go again. 
technology that separates us from our world, or this feeds kind of technological addiction. But if you look through this in that kind of more than human notion I was talking about, things are fundamental, this kind of cyborgian relations is how different, so part of it is included because of Zoom, but how different is someone with their mobile phone from the prosthetic creature within their car, of which you have a traffic light for, or one attached to their bicycle and having a, a pedestrian button for their bicycle, or wearing clothing and, and when it's raining, again, that kind of being the runner in that kind of sort of order. How, relation, how different is it, that kind of prosthetic, the, the slightly different prosthetic creature, one with their mobile phone? And in a weird way, it's almost as if the traffic center intersection itself designed the mobile, the, the traffic light for those people on mobile phone. There is a shared agency, what looks for on the network. If you want to look for where the agency is, you have to look across the network. Or what those in Guattari called assemblage, that this forming together is what forms them. So we can almost argue that it was the things itself that continue to design other things. And we have other language for this in a human-centered world, constraints and so on and so on. But in fact, it really is, we are shaping through sedimentation in other ways in which the things we have created are really in part, partly dictated, partly informed, become part of the agentic capacity of the networks and assemblages that we're surrounded by. But it doesn't just have to be technological and it doesn't just have to be now. This is a portrait of Rajay van der Weyden, an illuminary in, I think, I don't know, 15th century, 16th century. This was painted during the Burgundian era, Northern Renaissance. And I mean, you look at these paintings, because the Dutch and the Flemish paintings, and they're like so dark. They're so austere. And you know for a fact, I mean, these people, they were, I mean, they were rich mother, but you know, I mean, they, they, these are people of power. These are people of prestige. And yet, how is it that they were so austere? What was the sign? What was it that, they, that it shows that they're, they're power and prestige? And actually what it is, is the black. So the black of the wool clothing, it's called Burgundian black. And Burgundian black is a very specific shade of black that they, at the time they had assessors, but they had judges, which would literally assess the black to make sure it was the right shade. It wasn't a poor version of it, or it was a knockoff. So that was really the cause that that was the black that people had to wear. Now, much of the recipe for how you make Burgundian black has been lost, or at least through because of the traditional language, old Flemish, old Dutch, also the, the way that they, cultural things, like you had to you leave the, the, the the ingredients for 12 prayers, which really is hard to translate now. This is a, a picture of um, Claudia Youngstrom, who is a Dutch textile artist in Northern Holland. Um, quite an amazing textile artist, so I was able to visit uh, her studio. And I would say, anyway, she's kind of like a more than human uh, textile artist. And she doesn't consider herself that, I, I do. In the sense that she, she all her wool comes from sheep that she raises. She raises her own drenched sheep. All the dye comes from the vet. She's amazing vegetable garden. It's outside her studio. So all the dye comes from there. So her, she was part of this research project. It was based on the uh, Utrecht um, to reconstruct or to reinvent, so to speak, the recipe for Burgundian black. What made Burgundian black? So this is what she came up with. The Burgundian black was made from the woad plant, which is this plant here, or also known as the indigo, but woad in Europe. Um, you would take the leaves and you would ferment them for three to four months. And depending on the weather, you'd have to water them and so on. So they get to the right. That should form a kind of blue shade. And then over here, you can see this root. That is the root of the matter plant. I minimum, that root should be five to six years old. Ideally, it should be 10 to 12 years old. And then the root itself should be dried for two years and then ground up and then fermented. And it's these organic processes that are really at work. That if you think about what makes Burgundian black, is all of these processes together that form the color of Burgundian black, that Burgundian black could not be made in any other way. This is what Diane Kuhl, when she was talking about this in terms of political ecology, and then Jane Bennett talked about this in terms of new materialism, but this discussion of a degentic capacity of matter which is to separate out from the kind of humanist notion where agency meant to be about con consciousness and reason. But agentic capacities, what are the effects? 
what are the agentic effects that things might have and how can we begin to understand them so we can start to see when I was just talking about it, agentic effects, we can start thinking about things as having agentic capacities. So yes, the design is to fundamentally shape who we are, but we alone are not designing. And so from here on forward, I can have the designers are really assemblies of humans and non-humans. We then I'll speak to and we don't, we are, as humans are not designers alone. The last point made was this idea that things are political. So this is a, a project of mine. And so I make, so I mentioned before, I, 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 I make things to ask questions, to ask research questions. And ask research questions, I, I do it through what I call counterfactual artifacts. So I make things that you wouldn't normally make. Like, why would you do that? But when you do that, you kind of ask a what if question. And then you can examine what are the conditions by which that thing you made might exist. So this is, and I overall, I call, it, I call it material speculation. So it's speculating in the now, it's speculating in material sense. So the ceramic wall, we made several of these ceramic walls. And it's called the tilting wall uh, because it tilts. So it's a ceramic wall that tilts. So every, uh, at its own discretion, randomly, three to four times a day, it may, it may tilt. And we ever really understand understand the relationships that we have with technology. And there's nothing more, I can't think of a, of a designed object, more mundane or something that hasn't been designed more than a bowl. I mean, you almost wonder what more could you design about a bowl? It's the most mundane thing. And in a sense, something that tilts on its own is the most trivial. So what happens when you bring the mundane and the trivial? It's a, it's a process called defamiliarize. You take something that's familiar and then you make it slightly strange and then that's ability to reflect on it. So we make these things, we have people live with them, we choose particular people to help us answer the question, call it co-speculating. So we had these tilting bowls, we had philosophers live with them for up to two years. And we would come back and we would ask them questions and interview them about what they were, their reflections on living with the bowl and, and, and their experiences. So this is one where we, there are actually two philosophers who live with this bowl and you can see they set up um, a piece of paper that we gave them with the ball, they lean that up against the outside of the ball and they put on the inside a tin cup. And this was like, well, we wanted to know, like, if we're not in the room, will it tilt? Like, you actually never see a tilt. You kind of hear it sometimes and you never really share it. You never really remember what the orientation was. So it was a tilting track. That's what this was. This was their tilting track. So they're really quite proud of it. It's kind of this age old philosophical question like, if nobody hears the tree fall, like, if nobody hears the bowl tilt, does it really tilt? And, um, so we came back like four weeks later, and this came up in our interview. One of them says, politically, think about that politically. That's the way refugees are treated sometimes. The same kind of surveillance with the ball, the same suspicion, exactly. So this sets of kind of relations they had, the relationship that they determined with the ball, this thing that was lesser than human, was then easily connected to ideas of surveillance which then for them was easy to connect to. And of course, at the time, it's still very much pressing this idea of refugees and who has what rights, who does not have rights, and what is the inequality of rights, and then what are those who have certain rights able to subject on others who don't, and what means of technology they can use. And all this from a mundane bowl that tilts. This is what you know, Bruno Latour would call matters of concern, that we have things, and they, 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 they relate to us until we interpret them, they bring matters of concern. They ultimately arrive on some level of being political, not political necessarily in the big P, but political in the necessity to negotiate. We are often negotiating with and through the things that we have. Then as we can see the politics coming at us. So we know, for example, in facial recognition systems, um, and, this, and, 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 and of course we know that the, the, the lack of um, work done in terms of the data sets that those who produce the kind of data that kind of use in the machine learning, that the inability for them to recognize those people that are brown or those people that are black and not be able to recognize by the facial recognition system, which is one thing. And that's part of the agencies and the capacity of what you gather to put into that system. But then to deploy that amongst police forces to actually allow it to be used. And we understand what that, that issue is, that kind of um, uh, ways in which things are connected, have matters of concern to them that really become quickly quickly noticed or quickly brought to the surface or quickly material in our world. This is a project by Saul Beza, a PhD, who's working with me from Eli Salva in Barcelona. He was doing work on wearable and he was designing facial prosthetics. 
and facial prosthetics that allow for the facial recognition system to recognize you as a separate individual. So in other words, you can create another identity through the facial prosthetics. And what's happening here is, of course, all of this kind of interrelations, the, 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 the things are not fixed. I'm talking about you can interpret a bowl connected to, to, to those people, to surveillance, you can make a bowl to refugees. But here you can understand how a, how a, 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 a recognition, computer recognition system recognizes what it is to be human and how that can be manipulated. And so there's a form of resistance that can also happen. That's the other side of the politics that one could resist some of the things that are happening in, in, with our relations, our situated relations to the technologies and the things around us. We also did a series of workshops among those who were trans, binary, non-binary um, and queer. And, and, and again, negotiating not just the identity that one has in our social sphere, but our social technosphere. And how does one negotiate this kind of room of negotiation? I was talking about the politics that are there. And where does one find moments of resistance or moments of other space within that political negotiation or negotiation with things that make us who we are? So this is not a static. This is a performative relation we do every time. That we're constantly performing our relationship to things that are not human. In post-phenomenology terms, I know I'm giving you a lot of terms, but hopefully some people that's really helpful, some you can just forget it if it's not helpful, just think about the example. Multi-stability is this idea and a counter the humanist notion that a chair is a chair. We're trying to find the absolute essence of what a chair is. And universally speaking, it'll always be a chair. Multi-stability argues that in fact, it's a phenomenological embodied relationship that we have to something that determines what it is. That any one thing has multiple stabilities. So facial recognition system has multiple stabilities. It is a racist system. It is a system that can create resistance. It is actually a system in which other identities can form. It is all of those things. And there, hence the need to kind of negotiate it. Okay, so I've talked about a lot of stuff and I'm actually, I'm gonna get, this is leading up to the quiz part of the, of the talk, uh, but let me just kind of sum up, okay? Um, so the first idea is that things are fundamental. So unlike in my world of human interaction, we think we need things are kind of actually accessories that we need to actually find ways to connect. We're prosthetic creatures, they're fundamental. Things shape who we are and we shape things. So things are a part of us in that kind of cyborgian relation. Things are transformative. They have agentic capacities. So that means things design. We are not the only designers. In fact, we design through and with things. We design them. And that's that notion. And then we have to think beyond the fact that how is it we, what does it mean to be part of an assembly as a designer that's doing the design? And things are multi-stable, so things are not fixed. They're dependent on situated and body relations to things. They need to be negotiated. So things are political. No matter how benign, no matter how mundane, no matter how trivial, like a ball that tilts, things are political. Okay, so that's the kind of setup. And I, gotta, I, won't, I won't, don't worry, I'm gonna belabor this. I'll go through these details really quickly. Um, but I wanted to talk about these three concepts. So that I think there's but other ones, but these I think are important in terms of designing with. So the first is speaking subject. And speaking subject shows up in a couple of different ways. But first of all, if, if we're as a human, we are an assembly of humans and non-humans that are designers, well then what is our role? And the role that's particular to humans or the capacity that's particular to humans is language. So in some sense, we're the speaking subject. Now, language is a very tricky thing. Language is a very deceptive thing. In fact, I don't even know that I'm speaking actually on my behalf or am I speaking to try to say things that you will like? I don't always know, but I am speaking. And when I'm speaking on behalf of things, it's not always clear whether I am speaking on behalf, their behalf or on my behalf or somewhere in the middle. But yet, language is what we have to negotiate a lot of the way in the world we're in. So as a human designer, a lot of your role is that as the speaking subject amongst the assembly of humans and non-humans that design. So let me give you an example. Uh, and another point about speaking subject I talk later about that's really important is what we gather for design. What we gather to design deserve, determines in large part what we design as much as our decisions come time over design. But I'll get to that in a second. But let me give you an example. So this actually, it's a flying type. And it's actually taken from Tim Ingold as a wonderful example of flying type. And I think about the, the, the vibrant matters of things. But so I, I decided to fly kite. I'm the speaking subject. I gather all the things that I need to fly kite, namely a kite, put on my running shoes. I had to go outside. I go to a park or something, or I go to a beach. And then I release the kite in the air and I'm running. 
Okay, so my idea of the kite, I'm speaking for the kite, say we're going to fly kite. Once the kite is in the air, then it's a, it's a kind of um, conspiracy. It's a kind of collaboration, I'm conspiring with the material of the kite, I'm conspiring with the strength that's attached to the kite, I'm conspiring with the shape of the kite, with the wind, with the air temperature, you know, with, 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 the, um, uh, with the other people around me. All of these things are flying the kite. I'm not literally directing the flight path. I'm kind of working in concert in this constantly responsive mode of thinking about what and where I just can go. And I have to think very much in the very specific sense of me making something and designing, that's what I feel is very much like. I am not the one that's guiding every move. It's responsive. There are things that are just happening. There are trajectories that are out of my control. There's agencies at work that I don't understand even, and they're making and forcing what's going on. Not unlike thinking about the hidden trajectories of the traffic intersection I talked about earlier. But this is the kind of notion that the speaking subject may be the one that initiates this, maybe the idea, may even speak on behalf of, but is now in this performative process of which control is shared, agencies are shared. In our own work, we kind of tried to do this. We looked at this is Donia Ojes, who just recently graduated with a PhD, and we've been working on some weaving projects lately. And she was looking at, we have this idea of repertoires. How do you get things to speak? How do you get non-humans that are designing with to speak? And I won't go into the details of that. Repertoires, I think something that designers are very good at because it's methods, but it's a series of translations. It's about listening. It's about attuning to. It's about what Anna Singh calls noticing. And here she was trying to work through listening and understanding, working with the, the yarn. And how he was participating and determining parts of the, of the design, design process. The second concept that I want to talk about is biography. So I think we, we you know, we, 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 and I say we as in designers or makers, we're very enthralled by the idea of making something new and bringing it into the world. This newness of it, the novelty of it, something that hasn't existed before. And the, the first part of the making is actually the most interesting. In fact, that's the one that, that concerns us the most. But we actually rarely think about what happens beyond that. And there's some real consequences to that. So this is, I want to give you a quiz. This is a potentially beautiful patent. This is a patent in 1965 by Sten Gustav Tulin, Swedish industrial designer. Um, and it worked for a company called Celloplast. It is, um, it shows you take a, a, a roll of polyethylene, you, it's a sort of a factory production, you roll it out, you cut it into rectangles. And then you weld the bottom and then you weld the top. And you actually cut away and you make these little, like they call them t-shirt like, um, bags. They were the plastic bags. So the, the, the ubiqu what once ubiquitous plastic bags that we used to use a lot and you know, I was shop with, really designed for 10 minutes of use. Incredibly cheap, incredibly elegant to design. This is a one free from a, in a design world. This is a design problem, elegantly solved. The issue, of course, is the full, as I call biography. So the biography is, we think now in inventive terms, is the bio, the energy force, the capacity of the things that are involved, the plastic, polyethylene in this case, the force of the designer. Stendhal stop tooling will always be associated, now not for good, as the inventor of the plastic bags. We have this kind of biography life. But the, the, that relationship continues into the world and inscribes itself into the world. That's part of the biography that we make. And then what does it leave behind? So this is what we don't have a full understanding of when we think about designing a more continuous world. What is the full biography of the thing that we make? What is the forces that we bring into the world? How does it inscribe itself into the world? And what does it leave behind? And how do we account for this? Particularly as we go up in scales, when we think about technologies, we think it's a wonderfully convenient thing that we all have these apps that give us weather reports no matter what city we're in because it's tracking our location. <laughs> and that in itself is the design problem. How do you create convenience? But in fact, we know very much with all of our helpful apps, and this is actually data from New York Times where they have bought, I believe it was 3 million, 1.2 million subscribers. They bought their data for three months and they were able to track their every location for three months that they were being pinged by their location services seven to, every seven to 20 seconds a day. But this is really what Shogana Zuboff is called surveillance capitalism. This is the surveillance state we live in. This is the world that we designed to cohabit. So in my book, I actually call this an anti brown This is the one that's literally designing against the very life that we want. Uh, it is designing against the place that we want to inhabit. That we want to inhabit. 
And this idea of, in fact, more than not, what we design our antibiographies rather than, or create antibiographies rather than biographies. So I was writing a book chapter recently, and this was about thinking about the end of biography. So think about when you design something, what is the end of the thing that you design, not what is the beginning? And it's something to think about. What is the very end of it? And maybe that's the starting point. And I bring up this example by Alice Zara, March of Rosenbaum, which is a children's village dormitory in northern, Africa, northern Brazil, made out of eucalyptus trees that were um, actually um, brought over in the late 19th century to Brazil, so they're quite ubiquitous around there. The bricks are made of the soil. Um, you know, it's what you would call a sustainable uh, uh, building. It has sort of passive cooling, et cetera. But what I really appreciate about, appreciate about this is the very end of this building when it is no longer what it leaves behind, that really that it does is after its use, it really simply comes back to the very place in which it was designed and it acts as a resource. It just returns to being a resource. Okay, last term, constituency. So I think that one of the challenges is that, hey, it's all, we're thinking through all these things and we think about assembling designers that are not just human, the things that we gather, I think about speaking subjects, gathering, I talked about, gathering a kite, getting my running shoes, gathering the air temperature, gathering the weather, the sun. That is a constituency that I need to fly a kite. And one of the things that I think we don't do is that we tend to think about the politics of involvement for design, and we put that on the individual. We're in a neoliberal era in which it's the individual designers, the individual creator who has to take on all the ethics. And they take on the ethics once they've made something or after they've made something. When in fact, all of the politics, all of the consequences happen much before that. They happen in the gathering. What you decide to gather and include and become part of your assembly and what you're going to design with. So I like to think about this like a kitchen. So if you think about a kitchen, you gather all the ingredients, all the non-humans that you need, you want to cook. You gather all the technologies, the pots, you know, the stove, whatever eating elements you have, the knowledge, the cookbook, or you know, or your mother's recipe, your parent, or, you know, or or her mother's recipes. You gather the knowledge of what you want, you want to cook. You gather the place, a specific place. You're grounded in that place, or there are kitchens of different ethnicity, different histories, and different cultures. You make the political decisions. Is this going to be a vegan kitchen? Is this going to be a non GMO kitchen? What is this kitchen going to be? All of this is done, all of this gathering is done before you even think of cooking a meal or before you even think of who's going to cook. So this is, and I don't think we could, this is what I have in terms of like design education or even creative education, this idea of what are the collective structures by which you can practice what you want to practice and how do we make those collective structures? And I think it's that collectivity and the one in which includes the gathering, thinking through the gathering of those things that are not new. So I think we do this in our studio. This is my studio example. But before I think through, all of the things that I've discussed, where I think through really the politics of it, what I've gathered, who I've gathered, et cetera. And I'm just not the only one that's doing the gathering. This is what Jane Bennett would call the political ecology of humans and non-humans. And I think it's that focusing on the ecology, focusing on the structure, focusing on the relations, designing with, what are we gonna to bring together? They're gonna to help us design. And there are examples. So in the book, I talk about the, the Life Patch Collective, which in which um, we would call do it do it yourself. It's a DIY bio collective in Indonesia. The in Yogyakarta. It's called Do It With Others. That is a kind of collective. And actually, we created for the, those the part of the collective included their parents, uh, the, the 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 places where they came from. How were these practices of do it with others part of that, and how did it inform their work? And their form of their, their work was all about the Yogyakarta River. How do they work with the water in the algae carter? How do they work with the wastewater? How do they work with bacteria that forms in there? How do they do fermentation projects with the algae carter river? This was a broad collective of all of your relations, the humans, the speaking subjects, the non-humans, of how all of this is brought together. This is and another project. This is, is by uh, Jurgen Bach, who used to be like a designer for um, um, oh, the Dutch, uh, really. Uh, Clemens, uh, the Dutch guys. <laughs> Jürgen Bach. Yeah, anyway, Jürgen Bach, the really industrial nice designer, uh, but together with his partner, um, McKink, they actually have a water school in Rotterdam. And the water school in Rotterdam is a community studio. A community studio that's based in the neighborhood. Anyone can be a part of it. 
And it's about designing with water in that neighborhood, thinking about water as wastewater, thinking about water that comes into the city, thinking about how you design for the water. This is again, that collective, the material that's brought together and, 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 and situated as a locale. And it's thinking through the studio itself. It's not just humans, but it's a more than human endeavor, more than human. So that's it. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I look forward to your questions.